London, January 1943. Buried deep in the cellars below Whitehall lay one of the world's most secret hideaways, Prime Minister Winston Churchill's cabinet war rooms. This was the inner sanctum of wartime British government, the room where Churchill presided over the anti-U-boat warfare committee. German sinkings of Allied shipping had halved the vital war supplies coming to Britain from North America. On his personal transatlantic line to Washington, Churchill shared these grim tidings with his close ally, President Franklin D. Roosevelt. And today... The Battle of the Atlantic was the longest and also the most important battle fought during the entire Second World War because upon its success depended the success of every other campaign in every other theater of the war worldwide. And if the United States and Great Britain were to invade, occupied Europe and then the heartland of Germany itself, the U-boat had to be defeated. The two leaders agreed on the severity of the situation and met in Casablanca for 10 days to address the problem. Politically, the significance of the Casablanca Conference 1943 was that it put defeat of the U-boat as the, the Allies' top priority. And that made sense because unless the U-boat was defeated, unless the Atlantic was free for the passage of American uh, troops and material, there could be no invasion of Europe, there could be no defeat of, of Hitler. While the Allied Chiefs of Staff hammered out a strategy, U-boat sinkings of merchant ships in the Atlantic reached record proportions. In the first three months of 1943, it seemed that Britain's vital supply lines with North America were about to be severed by the German wolf packs. In the first 20 days of March, fighting Allied convoys, the U-boats sank half a million tons of Allied shipping. And in the British Admiralty, there was grave concern that they might be staring defeat in the face because if the convoy system did not work, what could work to replenish the needs of Great Britain? It really began to look at that point as if the convoy system itself would break down, that the Atlantic would be barred to Allied traffic, uh, if you like, the losing of the war. With U-boat production at its highest level ever, Dönitz's commanders were confident of victory. We uh, assumed that in 1942-43, the war could be ended by forcing England to her knees. We participated in some of the largest convoy battles of the war. The spirit in April 43 was rather high because of the uh, successes we had achieved at that time. We felt we would be able to starve out England uh, within the next year or so, and the war would be over and we all could go home. It seemed that the commander-in-chief of U-boats, Admiral Karl Dönitz, through the armed determination of his leadership and the prowess of his men, had victory within his grasp. But the intrinsic nature of the U-boat war was changing in a way Dönitz failed to see. The German effort during World War II reflected a rather romantic view of war, that after all, the human dimension is the decisive dimension, that men who are the best trained, with the best inspiration, with the most to fight for, will be those who triumph, rather than those who might have material advantages or numbers on their side. The Battle of the Atlantic was not only a battle between the U-boat crews on one hand and the aircraft crews on the other, and of course the surface ship crews. It was also a battle between the scientists and technologists on each side. The key player in this scientific revolution was radar. A new invention at the beginning of the war, confined to large land-based stations, it was rapidly miniaturized and placed on ships and in aircraft. Many of us in universities were summoned before the war began to uh, take part in the development of radar. 
The transference of these radar systems, which worked on a comparatively long wavelength of about 16 meters, uh, to operate in aircraft was just beginning. One of my jobs was to help put the one and a half meter system in the new Hudson aircraft for Coastal Command to use against the U-boats. That metric radar system became the invisible scout for detecting surface U-boats from the air and catching their crews unawares. The planes came out of a complete blanket of clouds and detect us. They couldn't have seen us. They had to have located us by radar. Our leadership in the operations department didn't want to believe it when we reported it. The reaction from the person responsible for this, Captain Meckel, said such a small U-boat, it isn't possible that it was located by radar. Despite this initial skepticism, the Germans soon introduced their own countermeasure. They made a very simple receiver known as METOX or METOX, M-E-T-O-X, and they were able to listen to the pulses from the one and a half meter radar, and when they heard those, they simply submerged. When we became acquainted with this, the solution was immediately obvious change the wavelength so that the Germans could not listen to our aircraft approaching them. The possibility had uh, arisen of generating very powerful radio waves on a wavelength of 10 centimetres uh, by the discovery in Birmingham by Randall and Boot of the cavity magnetron. The cavity magnetron was one of the great scientific inventions of the war. Today there is one in every domestic microwave. This vital component transformed the ability of radar to detect U-boats on the surface. The centimetric radar it made possible was adapted for use in the planes of coastal command by Sir Bernard Lovell's team. Within a remarkably short time, the whole of this was miniaturized and, and, and transformed uh, through a series of really brilliant ideas by, by many of the young scientists who were working then. And within a few months, we were flying this. Radar removed the surface U-boat's cloak of invisibility at night, the time at which it came up to recharge its batteries. But Allied planes, even though they could now locate a U-boat at night, still lacked the means of successfully attacking it in the dark. In 1942, was, there was introduced the Lee Light, the brainchild of a remarkable Wing Commander Lee, whereby a, a, a searchlight was mounted in an aircraft and used in conjunction with radar, was able to illuminate a U-boat found on the surface at night. I formed 172 Squadron. We trained the new crews to fly the Lee Light Wellingtons. The aircraft would pick up the, the, the target by radar, then home onto it, gradually reducing height to 250 feet when the lee light was switched on. And as soon as the lee light picked up the target, it was lit up like daylight. And uh, the searchlight operator holding the submarine in the beam reduced height to 50 feet and himself dropped the stick of depth charges across the U-boat. For the first time, the uh, aircraft of Coastal Command had the ability to kill U-boats both by day and by night. The new centimetric radar system entered widespread service in naval escort vessels in 1942. This Type 271 was the first effective naval radar in the world and transformed the ability of escort ships to locate U-boats on the surface of the water. But there was another kind of system for detecting U-boats that the Germans never knew about, called HFDF, High Frequency Direction Finding, or HFDF. It homed in on the U-boats' radio transmissions back to base. The great contribution which HFDF made to the Battle of the Atlantic was that it enabled escorts to uh, track down the transmissions that a U-boat was making in the vicinity of the convoy. If a U-boat had a message, if it had sighted us, for example, it would surface, uh, make a transmission which started in Morse, B-bar, B-bar, B-bar. 
Now, we carried receivers which uh, were tuned to that frequency and they, the output of the receivers was displayed on a cathode ray tube. So, as soon as a U-boat came up, it started to transmit and that appeared on the cathode ray tube as a direct straight line, a straight line, and this pointed uh, to a gyro compass ring round the cathode ray tube. So the operator of the HFDF equipment was able to read off the bearing on which the U-boat was transmitting. All we had to do then was to gently cruise down the bearing and eventually we would come to the submarine either on the surface or by then it would probably have submerged and we would pick it up on sonar and attack them with depth charges. The contribution which HFDF made to winning the Battle of the Atlantic was enormous and it probably has never been really recognised. The contest between Allied and German scientists to invent new devices to confound their enemies had become a key factor in the U-boat war. So had the capacity to build these products. The United States' outstanding ability to manufacture a standard item in huge numbers became critical, especially in this tonnage war, where the enemy's declared aim was to sink Allied merchant ships faster than they could be built. In 1940, America constructed 54 ships. Two years later, that number had grown to 746. One decisive contribution of America was from her shipyards in, in mass producing merchant ships, standard merchant ships, which were called Liberty ships, in such quantities, because in the last resort, the, the Battle of the Atlantic was a war of attrition. Yet another enormous contribution of American shipyards was in the production of naval escorts. Not only the small uh, escorts, but also uh, by the end of 1942 into 1943, the first of the escort carriers, which could carry just a few aircraft and which could accompany a convoy. And that meant that each convoy actually had with it its own air cover. And that was an almost entirely American built ships. The introduction of escort carriers marked a new phase of the U-boat war, providing continuous air protection for the convoys from one side of the Atlantic to the other. The balance of advantage in the Battle of the Atlantic lay with the submarine. Most of the advantages were his. If we could produce air power over the convoy, then that shifted the balance markedly. And one of the things that we did uh, was to introduce the Mack ship which was the merchant aircraft carrier. And these were standard grain and oil carriers in which a, a rather rudimentary flight deck was put on, and then three or four uh, swordfish were embarked on them. And if one could just imagine the North Atlantic in the, in the depths of winter, it must have been quite horrendous flying these string bags, as we affectionately call them, from these, from these aircraft carriers. They had that tremendous deterrent effect that whenever the submarine put his periscope up, scanned the horizon, if he saw the dear old string bag up there, he knew that it was carrying a torpedo, he knew that it had bombs, it had the ability to really spoil his day, and that was enough to make him keep his head down. And the aircraft would have achieved its aim just by flying. Air power had achieved another aim. Increasing numbers of very long-range liberators operating out of Iceland and Newfoundland had at last plugged the mid-Atlantic gap, the so-called Black Pit, where U-boats had traditionally operated with devastating success against convoys. By May 1943, the lines were drawn. A decisive battle was about to take place between a confident U-boat fleet, buoyed up by its great successes in March, and an Allied force with a rapidly growing technological and tactical superiority. In May, in one of the most dramatic turnarounds of the entire Second World War, the experience level of the escort vessel crews and of the aircraft crews, and also this new technology, radar, airborne as well as seaborne, and puffed up, and aircraft uh, such as the VLR Liberator, gave the Allies a technological advantage. In early May 1943, one night our convoy was surrounded by 32 U-boats, the Wolf Pack, and that night and a few days later, something like 18 ships were sunk. 
but five U-boats were sunk. The U-boats lost 41 of their craft in that one month alone. And the Allies lost only 36 freighters and tankers. Very soon afterwards, something like 100 ships came through with no losses at all, laden to the gills with munitions and food. That proved to be the decisive month of the war. And at the end of that month, Admiral Carl Dernitz, Commander-in-Chief of U-Boats, called back all of his U-Boats in the North Atlantic convoy lanes. We realized that uh, the war at sea had uh, changed drastically, and we had to uh, reconsider uh, all of our options. Dönitz considered those options, not just as the chief of the U-boat arm. Early in 1943, Hitler had made him head of the Navy. He had taken up residence in Berlin at the Hotel am Steinplatz and continued to direct the U-boat war, though increasingly at a distance. Withdrawal from the Atlantic was temporary, he assured his commanders, a tactical retreat, not a defeat. Their Type 7C U-boats would be improved, he promised, and there would be more of them. With Hitler's approval, Type 7C production was increased to a record 40 vessels a month. Headquarters was so convinced that one type of submarine, the 7C boat, would successfully complete the war at sea and win the war at sea for Germany. They concentrated on that type and never improved that type to meet the changes that were in the offing. Large numbers of submarines of that type were ordered to be built. When the changes came out of the blue sky, we were not prepared with new designs, with new submarines to meet those changes at sea. Late in the day, Dönitz addressed these changes. This building in Berlin became the headquarters for one of the highest priority projects in wartime Germany. On Dönitz's orders, a whole new generation of technically advanced U-boats were to be designed, machines so sophisticated they would render all the enemy's anti-submarine measures ineffective. The Allies had their big secret too. Bletchley Park, north of London, housed Britain's top secret code-breaking team. Working quietly in this motley collection of huts and outbuildings, they had cracked the new German naval enigma code at the end of 1942, after a nine-month blackout period that had followed the addition of a fourth rotor to the German code machine. It was one of the most significant achievements of World War II. For the rest of the war, the code breakers at Bletchley could read all the secret messages that passed between Dönitz and his U-boats. Despite the suspicions of some U-boat commanders that their signals were being read, their superiors dismissed that possibility. The German cipher and signals authorities were so convinced that the enigma was unbreakable that however many operational uh, doubts were brought to their attention, they shoved them off and said, there must be some other explanation. You're dreaming there's some other explanation. And a very big inquiry assured them that it could not be the enigma. Due to this central German conviction that the enigma is an impregnable machine, it can't be broken. It could be broken for a day or two here and there if it's captured or a few pages of the settings are captured. But continuous reading is out of the question. That's what they, that's what they said. They start from that point and everything else follows. In late September 1943, the U-boats returned to the Atlantic in a new and terrible offensive. Dönitz was pinning his hopes on stopgap technology. The fitting to the Type 7C of multiple deck guns to shoot down enemy aircraft. An acoustic torpedo attracted to its target by noise from the ship's propeller. A steel gauntlet was once again being applied to the Allied throat. And for Dönitz, there were still propaganda coups. Flying 48 victory pennants from his periscope, his claimed sinkings during the war, 
Wolfgang Lutz returned to Bordeaux in October 1943 after a record patrol of almost seven months in the Indian Ocean. This made him the top scoring ace with Otto Kretschmer. He received Hitler's highest military order, the addition of diamonds to his Knight's Cross, Oak Leaves and Swords. The trip was a remarkable feat of endurance and survival for him and his men. The wonderment about how the little U-boats went so far and did so much, that's one of the reasons we have all the rumors that persist till today. How did they do it? And the way they did that was to get resupplied from these huge U-boat tankers or supply ships called milk cows, if they jokingly call them. And refueling took place in the Atlantic and that enabled the U-boats to go as far as they did and to carry on as long as they did. The milk cows provided extra torpedoes, food, fresh baked bread, everything that could be needed. They even carried doctors on these that sometimes did surgery for the injured U-boat men. So they were just a vital assistance to the U-boats. The Milch Cow was a purpose-built supply submarine. Twice the size of a Type 7C U-boat, it had developed out of the extension of the submarine war to the American East Coast in 1942. Sinking one milk cow, the Allies realized, would starve many combat U-boats of essential supplies. The team at Bletchley Park were able to pinpoint the time and place of their remote rendezvous through their deciphering of German messages. Armed with that information, American escort carriers were deployed to hunt down the milch cows and sink them. It marked a significant change in the U-boat war. For the first time, the Allies were on the offensive rather than defensive. Bletchley's decoded information was now being used aggressively to take the war to the enemy and hit them where it hurt the most. We crippled the operation of U-boats at any distance. I mean, they couldn't keep the boats at sea long enough without refueling them. And we killed about 14 or so mother refueling boats. By the end of 1943, we'd almost killed our refueling system altogether. This was a catastrophe for Dönitz. His hopes of a formidable offensive in distant waters collapsed overnight. Also, his new acoustic torpedoes had been unsuccessful. In November, he abandoned the convoy lanes as an area of operations for a second time, and once again retreated to his lair to lick his wounds. Tactics, as well as technology, were changing the U-boat war. Dedicated groups of support ships were now being assigned to hunt down and kill U-boats. The leading U-boat hunter was the charismatic Johnny Walker, a Royal Navy captain. His support group sank more U-boats than anyone else, a record 28. The essence of Walker was an offensive attitude, an aggressive attitude. It was not defensive, it was not stand back and wait for them to come, it was go for them. As a support group, we didn't have to go back to a convoy. We were there to sink U-boats. We were there to hunt U-boats and to sink them. Walker's uh, strength uh, was in total dedication to his job, uh, total technical competence, and uh, a ruthlessness. His great innovation was the creeping attack a deadly tactic against a U-boat seeking to escape detection by diving deep and remaining silent. While one of his sloops held sonar contact with the U-boat and acted as a controlling ship, another quietly crept up on the unsuspecting target, suddenly releasing large numbers of depth charges around it. The end of January 1944, we went out on a patrol, and in the course of that patrol, we sank six U-boats in succession. On our return to Liverpool, the entrance to Gladstone Dock was uh, lined with staff from the base. Wrens, there were hundreds of them there. Sailors all cheering us in, 
and uh, waiting for us when we came along the dockside was the First Lord of the Admiralty, Mr. A.V. A. Alexander, who was there to greet us and he compared our activities, uh, he compared uh, what uh, Captain Walker was doing to uh, Nelson and the Battle of Trafalgar. It, they were sort of grouped together in his speech of welcome. Of course, we brought prisoners back too. I don't know what they thought of it when they saw all these thousands of people waiting to cheer us into Gladstone Dock. But a very moving experience that was. And one I shall long remember. That joy was to be short lived. Walker died suddenly of a stroke, brought on by extreme exhaustion, the result of his relentless pursuit of U boats. His crew were devastated. When Walker died, it became a personal thing. Uh, it, this great man, had, whom uh, his thousand British tars in his six sloops loved, had gone. And it became the fault of the Germans. And I think it's difficult to dispel that thought even today. It was a different world without him. It is all too easy to take a look at war, particularly the conduct of battle at sea in romantic terms, or to reduce it to statistics to think in terms of chess pieces moving across an ocean, however violent. But the fact of the matter is that there was intense human suffering. One only has to see pictures or hear reports of men who've been burned from tankers that have been torpedoed in a wild Atlantic sea, to see survivors dragged alongside coughing out their lungs which have been filled with bunker sea oil, to see survivors in broken lifeboats who can never be picked up as the convoy goes by, and you know that that person will never be found again. These are the dimensions of war, which are bitter, which are terrifying, which are morally repugnant. War is nasty business. War is about suffering. War is about violence. He's gonna ram us! Allied propaganda created a fearsome image of the Nazi submarines. U-boat men were cold-blooded killers in this wartime film, starring Humphrey Bogart and Raymond Massey. Look out for the diving games! I'm clear! In wartime, you have to paint your enemy in black and white. And for this reason, all the negative images which could be evoked to promote a hatred and a scorn and an anxiety about this weapon were used by Allied propaganda. Where the public perception has been that of brutality, acts of violence, or machine gunning survivors in the water, the documented evidence suggests that with the exception of one case where a court, a military court, found that a submariner had actually machine gunned survivors in the water, that the German submariners were impeccably correct in their behavior both in terms of the laws of the sea, these unwritten understandings of how people behave when they are at sea, as well in terms of international law. The examples are legion of submariners who have stopped to give aid to victims in lifeboats, give them water or some basic supplies and give them a course for land. Dernitz was aware of this and he really was very uneasy about it. He understood why his commanders wanted to do these kind of things, but he knew that they were putting the boats at risk. This situation came to a head in September 1942 with the sinking by U-156 of the British liner Laconia in the South Atlantic. On surfacing, the commander of U-156, a man named Hartenstein, discovered that most of the men on board were Italian prisoners of war. And he decided on his own initiative that he would undertake a rescue mission not just of the Italians, but of everyone who had survived the sinking. And he radioed his intentions to Dernitz in Germany. In the evening, the 
U-boat which we had seen from time to time overtook us. We learned later that her captain was a man named Hartenstein who had taken it on himself to organize a rescue not only of the Italians who were his allies but of all survivors. The sight of a U-boat alongside us, our arch enemy, was a very menacing proposition and uh, without meaning to he put the fear of God into us. A reluctant Dernitz agreed to the action and he diverted boats to participate in this mission. Uh, they also got the cooperation of the Vichy French government to send, mission, to send vessels from their port of Dakar to link up with the U-boats and help bring in the survivors. U-507 was one of two other U-boats sent to help Hartenstein with the rescue. We got the radio message that we were to go to Hartenstein and take part in the rescue operation. We took the English, Poles and Italians on board. We gave them food and water and we even let them have a smoke. With about 180 Italians and 250 English men, women and children, we soon got to the limit of what we could hand out. During the rescue mission, an American bomber appeared over well, one of the U-boats involved and circled and radioed back to base for instructions as to what it should do. It disappeared beyond the horizon for a while and then returned. Its orders were to proceed with an attack on the U-boat, despite the fact that the U-boat's deck was covered with survivors and the boat was towing several lifeboats. The Liberator dropped two depth charges. We were blown into the air. It's a wooden lifeboat and the lifeboat was destroyed along with, I suppose, about half its complement. Uh, about 30 men died in that attack. Those of us who were strong enough uh, scrambled on top of the wrecked lifeboat upside down. We were, I remember being terrified of my genitalia <laughs> and clutching myself, absurd, but absolutely terrified. The Liberator dropped further depth charges in successive runs. Throughout the air attack, Hartenstein had a white sheet emblazoned with a red cross draped over his deck guns. All this time, Hartenstein and his U-boat men, who had reasonable anti-aircraft equipment, had not moved to their guns, and had they done so, the Liberator was in such a position, so low and so intent on its work that I think Hartenstein might have blown it out of the sky. The air attack forced the three U-boats to reluctantly abandon their rescue mission. The majority of survivors were picked up by the Vichy French boats from Dhaka. Tony Large, however, spent a horrendous 40 days adrift in an open lifeboat before his rescue. Eckhard Schiraus injured his hand during the Laconia rescue and could not sail with his U-boat on its next mission. He was a lucky man. His boat was sunk with all hands off Trinidad. The two other U-boats suffered similar fates. On the next patrol, the U-boats U-156 Hartenstein and U-506 Vodemann were sunk with the loss of all hands. I have nothing but reverence and, 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 and fondness for the memory of Werner Hartenstein, who was, who was the captain of U-156, who who will save my life and save the lives of many, many others, having done his damnedest to destroy us. Following the Laconia incident, Dernitz issued a notorious edict to his men, forbidding any similar rescues, but Hitler wanted him to go further.
It is important to note that while Dernitz opposed any real actions on behalf of survivors by his commanders, he nevertheless actively resisted Hitler on every suggestion by the Fuhrer that survivors should be shot. Dernitz directly opposed Hitler on that issue and said, no, mein Fuhrer, we cannot do that. It is against the honor of the U-boat service to undertake such actions. You cannot maintain the morale of an elite service if you order them to machine gun helpless people in the water. Dernitz, as head of the Navy, now moved in the upper echelons of the German high command. Although he remained chief of the U-boats, he was increasingly remote from their daily operations, and the personal contact with his men was fast fading. Dönitz had entrusted the production of his new secret submarine, the Type 21, to Albert Speer, German Minister for Armaments and Munitions. Until they were ready, however, Dönitz's crews had to sail out in their obsolescent machines to face the Allied onslaught. We faced the enemy in 1944 the same way as we faced it in 1940. But because of the spirit in which we were trained, because of the strength of the German upbringing within us, we were ready to commit harakiri, just like the Japanese uh, committed uh, kam uh, kamikaze suicide. We did exactly the same thing, only in a slightly different way. And all of our crews were ready to commit suicide for the Führer and for the fatherland. Yes, we did. We tried to commit suicide. We went out again and again in our attempt to commit suicide because it was nothing else during the last couple of years of the war. There was no sense in going out to win the war. It was lost. But we couldn't tell our men. We could not even suggest it to ourselves. And we had to go on. And we followed what we were trained to do, to commit suicide. Most of us succeeded. Fortunately, I did not succeed. And I brought my men home. And I'm proud. Dernit said to his U-boat men, by continuing the fight, you are tying down Allied resources that could otherwise be used against Germany. And in effect, he's saying, you are buying time. You are, in effect, being almost sacrificed until we have the kind of U-boats available that we can carry on the fight in a new campaign with renewed vigor and strength through a brand new type of submarine, which will defeat the new Allied countermeasures. But that new submarine was not ready, and in the first three months of 1944, Dönitz lost 33 boats. The one device that might have stemmed the losses, the Schnorkel, was slow in being fitted to the Type 7s. This was a breathing tube that allowed the U-boat to take in air and charge its batteries without surfacing. In 1944, Allied air cover of the oceans became so intense that a U-boat's chance of survival without this device was extremely poor. Anglo-American mastery over the U-boat was defining the course of World War II. It made it possible to safely transport by sea to Britain an American expeditionary force of 300,000 men and the millions of tons of war materials needed for the Allied landings in France. It meant in the months before D-Day in June 1944, the Allies were able to run 100 ship convoys to Britain without loss, but Dernitz still planned to redress that balance. Slipping quietly into the water in Hamburg a few days before D-Day on its first sea trials, was Dönitz's long-awaited wonder weapon, the Type 21 Unter Seeboot. Type 21 was the first real submarine in the history of naval warfare. It was no longer forced to surface to charge batteries, 
but it could stay uh, for extended periods underwater. So a new era in the U-boat warfare started. It was a era of total underwater war. Before, their submarines had been basically surface ships that would occasionally submerge. They built a submarine that was intended to remain submerged all the time. The main advantages of the Type 21 over the existing U-boat Types 7 and Type 9 were first the extended range underwater, the increased underwater speed, the increased diving depths for these U-boats, and of course the greater firepower because they had six bow tubes and were capable of firing a total number of 18 torpedoes within uh, less than 20 minutes. It had a snorkel built into it, but it was built in telescopic like a periscope went straight up and down. And this Type 21 submarine was bigger, much, much faster. It could go up to about 16 or 17 knots submerged, had it for, and it could run on batteries for several hours at 16 knots, which is an amazing development. But the fundamental thing was it could remain submerged and could make high-speed submerged. The Allied fear that the new boat would render all their anti-submarine measures ineffective prompted massive aerial bombing raids of the Type 21 construction yards in Hamburg, Bremen and Danzig, where final assembly of the U-boats took place. Despite the havoc this caused, by the beginning of 1945, 90 boats had been completed and Dönitz was planning a return to the Atlantic in a new March offensive. Meanwhile, his men still went to war in the obsolete Type 7s and 9s. In the final six months of 1944, Dönitz lost 112 U-boats at sea. Life expectancy for U-boat men on patrol had sunk to two months, and still they went out. It is difficult to understand today that we did what we did. Uh, and yet we did it without uh, questioning, without asking. We did it because we were trained to do it. We were brought up in a rigid society that knew nothing else but to obey an order, whether the order was right or wrong. The uh, losses at sea were quite obvious, especially when you were out on a mission. You could hear of their last message. It was uh, a standing order to send a message, if you could, of your own demise. And when we came back to port, we found that our pens were deserted. So you realize that the losses were extraordinary, but you try to avoid thinking about it. It was quite obvious that the intent was to send our men out to die at sea. Dönitz gave a speech once where he spoke of the fanatical willingness to die. Of the fanatical willingness to die. And uh, these young people had been imbued with this. It was clear to them that their chances out there weren't great, but they were nevertheless willing to die. As far as the Navy was concerned, service itself was an end in itself. Service for the fatherland was an end in itself, irrespective of whether the National Socialist Workers' Party was at the helm or any other party that they could have imagined. Political ideology, it would seem, played a minor role in life aboard a U-boat. There were individuals on board a particular U-boat who might be known to be an enthusiastic Nazi, and typically people would know what to talk about around him or what to avoid that you really didn't have this kind of, of politicization of a U-boat crewman that some people seem to think did occur. The fact that they were such efficient fighters, the fact that they put up with the losses they did, make them appear to be fanatical. And yet all of my experiences, both with individuals and with primary source documentation, does not support that contention at all. At Winston Churchill's secret underground headquarters in London, 
the scene of so many uncertain moments in the U-boat war, a new confidence prevailed. At the heart of Allied success lay that great transatlantic partnership of Churchill and Roosevelt, and their joint determination for five and a half years that the goods would be delivered and the rattlesnakes of the sea would be vanquished. The success of the Normandy landings, the re-establishing of the Western Front, and the clearing of the way for an eventual invasion of Germany itself, all stemmed from the defeat of Dönitz's U-boats in the Atlantic and his failure to sever those vital supply lines between Britain and North America. By March 1945, Dönitz's plans for a new offensive with the Type 21 had crumbled. The Russian army had taken Danzig. The Western Allies had crossed the Rhine and were mounting devastating bombing raids on Bremen and Hamburg. At the end of April 1945, following Hitler's suicide, Dönitz became German head of state and began to negotiate the nation's unconditional surrender. On the 4th of May, he sent out a special message to his beloved U-boats. Undefeated and spotless, you lay down your arms after a heroic battle without equal. A continuation of our fight is no longer possible. It is an index of the U-boat crew morale that on the last day of the war, in May 1945, there were still 43 U-boats at sea looking for targets. They were stunned by Dönitz's order, some believing it was a hoax by the Allies. But the majority surrendered obediently, a few in American waters off New Jersey and Maine, but the majority around the British Isles. Over 1,150 U-boats had been built during World War II, at the war's end, almost 800 had been sunk or destroyed. The U-boat crews came ashore for the last time, their iron discipline intact. The majority of the U-boats which surrendered were moored either at Lissa Halley in Northern Ireland or at Cairn Ryan in the southwest of Scotland. At Lissa Halley, we had between 45 and 55, and they were moored in troughs of five or six abreast. The main work of maintaining them was carried out by German crews. They sang vigorously as they were marched down in the mornings to, to the boats and quite likely sang again as they came back to their quarters. They still regarded their U-boats as theirs. They were proud of them and wanted to see that they were maintained to the necessary standards. The um, major allied governments, uh, United States, United Kingdom and Russia, agreed that they would each be entitled to take six U-boats and that the remainder would be scuttled in the North Atlantic in deep water. The main object was to dispose of them so that they could not be used offensively again by any country. In Operation Deadlight, the Royal Navy and Air Force used the remnants of the once mighty fleet for target practice. It was the end of Dönitz's iron coffins. Dönitz was tried by the Allies at Nuremberg and sent to Spandau prison for 10 years. He served his full sentence and was released in 1956. When he died on Christmas Eve, 1980, he was refused a state funeral by the German government. He lies buried with his wife and two sons, both of whom were killed at sea during the war, in this village cemetery near Hamburg. And what of those who served their beloved Grand Admiral so loyally? The U-boat effort was undertaken with such faith with such zeal, with such superhuman effort, that these men waged a campaign of unbelievable exertion of energy and will and morale. The losses they suffered were so horrific. 32,000 killed or captured out of a total force of 40,000. A rate loss that's matched only by the kamikazes in the Pacific during the end of World War II. And yet they were still able to perform, they were still fighting up to the last day. 
And in the end, it was for a regime that represented what? Auschwitz, Buchenwald. And that, I think, has been the difficulty that U-boat submariners, that U-boat crewmen today still have to deal with. The last of the iron coffins completes a long sea journey. Its final resting place, ironically, is Liverpool, the city that masterminded the U-boat's defeat where it is to go on public display. It comes not as a trophy of war, but as a reminder to future generations of the fearsome threat the U-boats posed. Above all, it is a lasting testimony to the courage, fortitude and sacrifice of the thousands of individuals on the Allied side, whose united efforts eventually ensured the U-boats' decisive and very necessary defeat.